Hello, my name is Ed Thorne, and welcome to Pembroke Today. Uh, today's my guest is uh, Fire Chief Mike Hill. <clears throat> Mike, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be talking about a bunch of things leading up to uh, the annual town meeting and uh, the annual election. And uh, for starters, uh, how about a brief background into your experience with the Pembroke Fire Department? Sure. I joined the department back in 1984 as a call firefighter. Uh, was assigned to Company 2 right down the street from my house. Um, whole family was in the fire department, so it was kind of what I wanted to do. Uh, became an EMT in 86. Um, was fortunate enough to become a career firefighter in 1987. Um, 1995, I became a captain. 98, I became a paramedic. And in 2015, I was appointed chief. All right. Well, uh, obviously, uh, like a lot of uh, the folks in the department, uh, this is a career. It it's is. It's not yep. something that uh, you guys all of a sudden decide yeah, when you're 30 years old or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's not a job you change out of lately. So That's right. Once you're there, uh, you're, you, you stick with it. And, and, and in the years that I've been with the town of Pembroke, uh, the turnover is uh, pretty low in the fire it department. Is. I it think, is. It uh, is very low. And, it's, uh, a, it's a <clears throat> great bunch of people. So um, for everybody out there, we've got a, a slideshow that was presented to the selectmen a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we want to you know, uh, expound on that, and uh, we'll start off with our, our first one, which is uh, the responsibilities of the department. Sure. Uh, well, obviously, we're the fire department, so we're responsible for uh, putting out and suppressing all the fires in town um, and then investigating them and uh, working with the police, prosecuting any, any suspicious fires that should happen. Um, we're also responsible for um, the EMS in town, all the personnel, are dual professionals, so the firefighters uh, certified at the level two um, standard, and then we have 27 paramedics and, and one basic. Now, when I first came in '98, um, the percentage of paramedics in the department wasn't like it is now. It isn't actually. When did that all evolve? In 1998, <coughs> uh, Chief Neenan, through town meeting, uh, got approval to um, train virtually the entire roster at that time to paramedic status, so we kind of split the group in two, and the first half took uh, paramedic training in 1998, mm -hmm. and then the next year, the remainder of the, the group, people who wanted to do it, um, moved up. So I think at the time we had 24, so I think 18 out of the 24 took the, took the training, mm -hmm. so, and that's when we started our, our ALS um, program and continues today. So. While we're talking about paramedics <clears throat> and the EMS uh, service, um, a lot of people want to know why we don't have a separate fire suppression department, fire department, firefighters, and uh, an emergency management or uh, emergency medical uh, personnel. Do you want to explain why it's beneficial to the uh, town? Well, that it's beneficial because I think we, again, you all have dual trained professionals, so whichever call comes in first, we will handle. So if the EMS call comes in first, we'll take the EMS call. If the fire call comes in first, now, obviously you can do that divided, mm -hmm. but it allows us to put more people in the building and on the street because of the volume of EMS calls. So it, it helps with the it helps with the manpower status. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. Well, let's go to the next slide, and, and we're going to be talking about what we have here, the increase <clears throat> in the number of calls to the department uh, since 97 uh, with the town's population. Yep. And you might want to just uh, explain that chart for us. Sure. Um, in 1997, Chief Neenan um, gained approval to add one more firefighter per shift. So at the time, we were running five per shift. Um, so through town meeting, um, he gained approval to add the additional firefighter. At that time, um, basic EMT. Uh, and you can see we were, we were doing 2,160 calls. And that was about the time we are in the, the predicament we're in now. Calls weren't getting answered in a timely fashion. The practice of running light to save the budget um, sort of, I won't say Trump safety, but kind of put it in a, in a, in a tight spot. So people were still responding alone back then. Um, and that, as you can see, the years go by, and the calls really don't jump up that much. 
in a two to three year span, but then all of a sudden they'll jump up three or 400. And, it, and it's a pretty good pattern, as you see, all through, through the 21 years. Yeah, um, it seems like it's almost a, yeah. almost a thousand calls per it is. year. Yep. So in the twenty in the twenty years we've annually have gone up nine hundred thirteen calls, and the population has gone up I think just mm -hmm. over thirty one hundred. So plus there's been so a thousand calls is like three a day. Yeah, something like that. Yep, it is in, uh, increase. Increase. So. And when the ambulance is, is being used more, the personnel who transport are, are out of town more. So that leaves less coverage for a longer period of time uh, in the station to cover all our, our fire suppression mm -hmm. calls. Uh, next slide. Um, it talks about a narrative that you have. <coughs> it um, extends in the uh, 21 years since the last increase has increased uh, an additional 913, little under 1,000. Yeah. <coughs> and you might want to uh, explain uh, the next couple of paragraphs. So, I mean, our overall call volume has gone up 42.5%. Um, about five and a half calls a day, which was handable back then to, with the, with the manpower that we have right now is the same, almost, uh, to just under nine today. So again, those, the ambulances are out of town more often. They're out of town longer now that we're an ALS um, provider. Um, now, by out of town, you're just talking about on your way to the hospital? So on your way to the hospital, providing patient care, and then transfer it to the hospitals, and then and we have to do our reports. And now our reports are um, all computer-driven, and they all have to meet um, the Office of Emergency Medical Services standards mm -hmm. um, and NEMSIS standards. So we can't complete a report until all of our bullet points have been met, and they're all several mandatory fields for whatever call we're on. So for, if we're doing any cardiac arrest or, or a chest pain call, we have to hit certain parameters or the, the computer won't let you finish your report. Right, and that's a good point. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't think that, okay, somebody's sick, you take them to the hospital and you drop them yeah, off. Yeah, we drop them off and then come back. <laughs> that doesn't happen. That doesn't right? happen anymore. <laughs> Even the BLS calls, because we have to do the computer-driven um, report forms that take a little longer. But, <laughs> And in uh, 03, you added a third ambulance? We did. We, um, in 2003, we, we added an ambulance just because we had been keeping our ambulances so long that they kind of went out of service for a little while. And even back then, we couldn't run with one. So we put a, a backup in service to use when we needed it. Mm -hmm. But as things evolved, that started getting used a little bit more often. And I think in the beginning, it probably did 20, 30 calls. And most of those calls were... Um, during the day while the chief and the deputy were in quarters. So there was a couple extra people to take that ambulance. Um, now we're just so busy that it, it's, it's gone all the time. It takes usually myself or the deputy chief um, with it. So now we're not doing our duties per se, or our duties are getting delayed because of that. Um, yeah, but and now it, it's, it, run, it runs constantly. Mm -hmm. Has um, the, um, the third ambulance, um, I remember when Chief Needham uh, would tell me that either the ambulance would be down for, for whatever reason, or and these things get inspected, correct? Yep, every year they need to be inspected by the state, yep. So it's not just going to the local gas station to get the motor vehicle nope. inspection, Nope, they right? get the, uh, actually they the comprehensive truck inspection yearly, and then the state comes down and inspects... Um, all the equipment that's on it, and then they do a little, they do their own mechanical viewing, as you could say, an mm -hmm. inspection, and if it doesn't pass, then we need to make the corrections. How much does a, a, a typical ambulance cost? Uh, well, you're going to sign some papers in a few minutes. <laughs> um, we are just going to enter into a lease um, for an ambulance, and the cost of the ambulance itself is probably $225,000, and then there's some additional things that are like structure amounts and stuff like that that have to meet KKK specs. So mm -hmm. the overall cost for this one is 237000 Right. Now, does that include all the equipment that goes inside? Uh, nope, that's basically an ambulance. If you wanted to, if we bought everything new, you could probably add another $50,000 if we were to buy new monitors and all the equipment that's on it. So, so you're taking that from a, an existing ambulance, some of the equipment? Yeah, we have a, a, an ambulance revolving fund. Um, 
its receipts are mostly paid by insurance companies, right. um, either auto or health. Um, there is a small portion of the bill that um, a patient is responsible for. Um, and for the most part, we're, we're pretty good at collecting that. There are some hardships. We do what we can to work with the person. Um, and sometimes people just don't pay, and we need to abate that. But Is it typical for a town our size to have three ambulances? I would say, yeah. We're, we're pretty similar to Bridgewater, but they have the college also. Um, with the population that we have, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Duxbury, for, for example, just put it a third the ambulance and quarters in, in, although they're bigger in area, they're not, they don't have the population that we sure. do, or the commercial property that we do. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but there's less people in town during the day, they're still busy enough to put a third ambulance in, in the ambulance so service. So when you pick up somebody, um, th th did they have a choice what hospital to go to? For the most part, yeah. <laughs> um, it depends, you know, if the patient's conscious and alert and they're having chest pain and they want to go come down to, to BI Plymouth, we'll take them to BI Plymouth or Brockton or South Shore. Mm -hmm. um, there are some rare occasions uh, that a person needs specialty um, care, like to, with the, have to go into Boston for it, we'll take them into Boston. Um, but it's, it's not a regular occurrence. Uh -huh. um, and so you if, go to the three area yeah, hospitals? Yeah, there's three area hospitals. And then South Shore Hospitals is a de designated trauma center. So most of our traumas need to go to South Shore. So if you get in a motor vehicle accident and you have a couple of things, you broke an arm and a broken leg, OEMS wants us to take them, mm -hmm. take you to, to the South Shore. Well, let's go to our next slide. And this is the effects of this almost <coughs> 1,000 additional calls per year. Uh, yep. So elaborate on that? Yeah, so as the, as the years went by, those last 20 years, um, we would do calls. And occasionally we get the back-to-back -back call, so a couple of ambulances will go out at the same time. For the most part, you know, an ambulance call would come in, we'd get back in quarters, next ambulance call would, would come in, we'd, we'd handle them one at a time for the most part. But over the last 20 years, that's no longer the case. Um, the folks at home are calling us all the time, at the same time. Um, case in point, if everybody remembers the audio I played at the Selectman's meeting, right. um, that was a three simultaneous hits at the same time on a six-man group. So there was one person left in the station to go to a, a pretty serious building fire. Um, that happens all the time now. That where it used to be the rarity where we'd have two or three calls at the same time. That between 6 a.m. and 8 o'clock at night are really our busiest times, but doesn't mean it doesn't happen between 8 p.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, 6 a.m. either. <clears throat> so that's, that's truly our, the hurdle that we're trying to get over. Um, we don't have enough people to do that anymore and still maintain uh, a safe firefighting force or even a, a safe manpower staffing, even to you know, put an ambulance in service with two people. Yeah, we had a department head meeting a little while ago, and, I, um, and you weren't there. I was there. And, and it was interesting because we heard an ambulance and a, and a truck go by, and uh, uh, Police Chief Wall said, uh, well, th that's where the chief that's is right now. He's on a call. He's not here at the, at the department. That's well, probably true. So uh, that was kind of interesting. And just to piggyback on, on, on a conversation about multiple calls, last Wednesday, you remember the um, small snowstorm we had? Right. It kind of turned into rain, and then we had a quick freeze. So we had a, a motor vehicle accident um, that required two of our ambulances to transport patients. Um, another medical had come in right after that. And then there was a, another motor vehicle accident in the center um, by the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, believed to be an overdose cause there, we're not sure. Um, but we relied on Hanson to come in to that. So I happened to be on the desk because I was hoping to get some paperwork done, but that didn't work out. Um, and I answered a phone call for a gentleman who had a chimney fire. And I had to tell him that there's nobody here. Um, we'll get to you as soon as we can. Seven minutes. Seven, so seven being minutes, a, on the desk, you were actually answering a 911 call? I answered the 911 call for the gentleman who said he had a fire in his house and had to tell him that nobody was coming for a while. Seven minutes later, he called back and asked if we were still coming. I said, yes, we do. We have trucks on the way, and we'll be there shortly. So everything worked out okay for that It guy? did. It was contained to the chimney, fortunately. So that's not always the case, especially in an older home. So... Okay, fine. Let's go to our next slide. 
So here's uh, what we've got the last two full years that we've got. So yep. um, what about these? <clears throat> so this just point, points out what we were talking about, how many times uh, we get the simultaneous calls. Um, over the last two years, we've, we have broken the 3,000 um, response mark. So we're averaging 3,010 calls. Of those 3,010 calls, 939 of those were simultaneous. So we broke it down a little farther. You'll see 228 of those calls came in within five minutes, five minutes of each other. So depending on the shift strength that we have right now um, dictates what goes where. So if we had a, and I'll just continue, sorry, on, sure. on this part, then the, you can add on another 489 calls that happened within 20 minutes of each another other. Another 489. Yep. So total the first two is how many times calls have happened within 20 minutes of each other. And then that last line is uh, three or more calls, so three, the four, the five, are how many times that has happened, that four or five calls have been happening simul simultaneously over the last two years. So, so it averages out to about two and a half times two and a half day, times a day. You guys will have at least two calls going, two on, calls at the same going time. on at the same time. Yep. Um, so over the last couple of years, obviously we can't have every, handle every single call with the amount of people that we have in the station, so that requires callback. So before we go to the next slide, when you're talking about recalling personnel, a lot of people will, will ask, "How come you see an ambulance and a fire truck sure. heading out at t to the same incident?" Yep. So you want to explain yeah. that? Yeah, um, twofold actually. Uh, it depends on the type of call. So if we get a call for a chest pain, shortness of breath, well, obviously the ambulance goes, the engine will follow. Um, when they get there, the paramedics will go inside, assess their patient. The engine will grab the stretcher, bring it to the door, or if they need to stay a chair, they'll grab that as well. Um, and they'll go in and meet, and meet the paramedic crew. Um, the paramedic crew will then, after they've done their assessment, one of them will usually stay, package up the patient, one will go back to the, to the ambulance and get whatever he needs ready to go. Um, if that patient is um, serious enough that they require a second attendant, then that attendant is already on scene. Um, we don't have to wait anywhere from two to 14 minutes, depending on what area of town you're in, um, for that truck now to come and provide backup. The backup's already there. So the assessment time, the loading time, and the transport time are quicker. Um, get somebody my size who's on a second story, you want to have the help there to, right. to, to carry them down. Um, two people with wet feet going in on a nice oak floor in, you know, in the middle of the night trying to carry someone down the stairs. One person slips. Now you have the patient who's more severely injured, and you have two people who, are, who went out on extended you know, injury on duty time. Sure. So, it's just it's a safety thing. And, and these incidents don't occur nine to five. Oh, no. no everybody, <laughs> everybody wants us at, at different times. They used to say, you know, you, you, you'd hit the rack. And when I first got on, you could hit the rack. And if you had one or two calls, it was fine. But it's 24-7 it's now. There's, right. there's no rest. So, so um, when we talk about recall, um, the next slide is talking about considerations about sure. the recalling. Now, what kind of personnel are we recalling at this point? So when we've extended the duty shift beyond what it can handle, we'll do what we call we transmit a box alarm. So it depends what the, the call is for. It's for a fire, we'll put a, a box alarm on a couple of stations and headquarters um, to get various pieces of apparatus to where we need them. Um, if it's for station coverage, they'll come back to headquarters. That's the primary station we cover all the time. So if it's a foreign ambulance call, they'll come grab an ambulance if it's still in quarters, or they'll need a mutual aid ambulance um, to provide them some assistance. Um, <clears throat> so who are you calling out? We are, we are calling our call firefighter. We have a, a platoon of maybe 20, 25 call firefighters now. Right. Um, and any off-duty career personnel. Correct. So they'll come back to wherever they needed, man whatever truck they need to man, and then handle the call. Do you have a list of uh, people who are top on a list to come in, or is it just uh, whoever nope, can it's make a, it in? Yep, it's a, it's a 
come all kind of call. <laughs> okay. um, come one, come all is what I was trying to think of. Uh, yep, so when we, you know, what we call um, strike the box, um, anybody's around usually shows up. Okay. So Hopefully. how many, okay, so if you, if you have this box alarm, as you called it, yep. right? How many people do you think you're going to be bringing into the station? Well, again, it, it depends on the time of day. Usually evenings are a little better because everybody's home. They've just gotten home from right. work. Um, they're still awake. Um, early mornings are okay. Um, that critical time between um, 6 in the morning and 5 at night, usually we will only get back um, off-duty career personnel because all of our call firefighters have a career that they have to you know, go to, well, oh, they sure. won't have a job. So uh, we really don't get too many of them back during the daytime hours. So on average, so during, that, during that time period, probably, you know, four or five career and a couple of call, and then maybe a little bit more during that, those evening hours. So you got a list of things that, uh, um, that you have to consider that why it's not a terribly reliable source yeah. when you bring these Yep. When you bring these folks in. So yeah. level of training, um, our call firefighters, not all of our call firefighters are EMTs or paramedics. Those who want to strive to become career firefighter paramedics will go ahead and become a uh, an EMT or a paramedic. Um, so if I'm putting a box on for an additional ambulance and all I get back is, you know, four or five call firefighters who aren't trained at the EMT level, then that ambulance is useless to me. So now we've delayed a little bit to see who we're gonna get back, and then we have to go mutual aid. So if mutual aid is busy, are they coming? You know, are they relying on their own call back personnel to come? Now my mutual aid, you're talking about other towns. Other towns, yes. Right. Yep. Um, so the time of day, at that critical point in time between six and five during the day where everybody's at work, um, our manpower isn't, our callback manpower isn't as much as it it, it could be. Uh, weather conditions, like I say, if, if, if there's a blizzard or a hurricane. Right. And the roads are blocked. That that's going to delay them. You must have had a tough time during Nemo, I guess. Yes, so. it was very. Fortunately, we we were a little proactive in that. When it started to get really bad, we manned all the stations. So whoever could come in did come in before it got really really bad. Mm -hmm. Now, by all stations in Pembroke, what are we talking about? We are talking about the headquarters in the center, which everybody can see, right by the post office. Um, we have a satellite station, call satellite stations at on School Street. Uh, one on High Street and the one on uh, mm -hmm. Washington Street by Barker. So those all are right. all unmanned stations that we well, let's go to our personnel. next slide. Um, why more personnel? Um, we think we uh, we know the answer to that um, because of the number of calls. Uh, anything you might want to add to this particular slide before we go to the, an important one, which is the next one? Other than the fact other than that that, that, that last paragraph there talks about how long you guys are on a call. Yep. And that's that's the key point, I think, in, the, in all of this. When we went to the ALS level, our, our transport times increased by 45 minutes to an hour. And then with the addition of uh, computer report forms, you know, it, it's, it's increased it to a good hour. Mm -hmm. um, so when an ambulance leaves, it's going to take 2 to 14 minutes to get to the call. It's going to take 10 to 15 minutes for the crew to assess their patient get them, load them up in the ambulance, and then it's going to take 20 minutes just to get them to one of the area hospitals that we go to. And again, 45 minutes to 60 minutes just to do the report. Sure. Um, and you, the, the time in the hospital is going to be even longer if certain hospitals, certain hospitals want registration to happen before mm -hmm. other things can happen. So there's a little delay in there. And if we need to replace any medicines or any equipment, especially narcotics now, um, you're going to add to that time because we cannot replace a narcotic without both attendants going okay. because they have to sign off, obviously, because of the perceived, well, not the perceived, the actual uh, opioid well, crisis. Let's go to our next slide, and uh, this is the one about six-person shifts versus uh, seven-person shifts. Yep. So currently right now, this is what we have. Um, last year at town meeting, um, 
well, before that, I had a, I had a plan for one more person per shift. Um, fifty percent of it was going to be coming from the revolving ambulance fund, and fifty percent of it was going to come from the town coffers. Um, the town budget wasn't able to support the two people that I wanted, so I needed I just needed to make a choice because we have to start somewhere. So the two people from the revolving portion of the article were passed, resulting in two, two shifts having seven people right. on a group. And we have the standard that we had before, which was two. Mm -hmm. So what's the big difference with a seven-person shift? Even just one person, the difference that it makes? The difference that it makes to us, if, if we have what we call still alarms, which are just regular go out and investigate or ambulance calls, we can put three pieces of apparatus on the road with two people apiece. That's the barest minimum that we can really work with. Mm -hmm. um, where as opposed to the six person shift, we'll have two calls with two people and then that third call is gonna rely on uh, callback. Mm -hmm. um, some sort or another, either we call somebody in or we transmit a box. So basically, um, that one person on that on those two shifts allowed you to have three pieces of equipment out. Yep. As opposed to just two pieces of equipment. Correct. Properly right? manned. Right. So when that third call comes in, we can start to the call on a six-man group, but one person can't do CPR effectively. Mm -hmm. One person can't transport in an ambulance. Um, obviously. So. So this is something that we're looking at for FY19, um, and we're um, looking at that and, and another proposal that you got to go to eight people on a shift. Correct. Um, and we'll be probably talking about that in the future as we get closer to the town election. Yep. So let's go to the final slide. Uh, we got just a little bit of time left. Um, future? Well, if we stay the way we are right now, something bad's gonna happen. Um, there's just so many, so many calls are coming in at the same time, and they're all similar calls. And they, you know, the bad one isn't always first, as we as we pointed out in the conversation about last Wednesday, and again on January first, um, the bad call was the last call. So our personnel leaving are putting themselves in jeopardy, and the townspeople are in jeopardy also, because mm -hmm. um, right. if we can't get there safely and do our job safely, then our ability to help them diminishes. Well, Chief, um, I appreciate the information. It's a lot, and I think we'll probably come back with a, an, another program. I was going to say, that was a quick 20 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, on behalf of uh, Chief Mike Hill and the uh, Pembroke Fire Department and the town of Pembroke, uh, we appreciate you folks uh, tuning in and, and listening to this uh, valuable information on our department and, and the things that we're looking for in the future. So uh, thank you again for, uh, for watching. And uh, um, this is Ed Thorne for Pembroke Today.